So to explain a convolution, I um, use the same or a very similar profile, but I made it even more simple this case. So you see even less uh, pixels. And this is supposed to be the original profile. And I just cut this in two to show you that these values are twice as high as this one. And the convolution comes as a simple recipe. It says, replace each of these guys with this thing, but make sure that the total activity in here or the total uh, integral of, of this thing equals the integral of with what you replaced. So we will apply that recipe to this. So we start from here and we go uh, from right to left for some reason. So we first replace this guy. So again, we consider it as a set of basis functions. So this basis function, is zero everywhere, goes up here, there, and there we apply this recipe, replacing this guy with this, and we make sure that the sum of these green things equals the sum or the, the total thing here. And then we do the same for this one, this one, and this one, these two are twice as high. We add everything together and we get this. And we see that we get a somewhat similar ef effect as what I've shown you with the filter before, this convolution preserves this block pretty well, but this peak suffers dramatically. It's only half the size as before. So there seems to be uh, an a relation between this convolution and the uh, Fourier transform. All right. <clears throat> now here is an interesting exercise. So I'm going to convolve signs with uh, different filters. And uh, we're going to look what happens to the sign. So the first thing to do is we, we take um, the sign and we convolve it with uh, a pulse, meaning the recipe is keep the value at every pixel and don't distribute it to the left or right. Basically, the recipe is do nothing. And then, of course, we keep our sign. Now we convolve it with a top hat function. <clears throat> of course, I, I just show them all at the same magnitude, but actually the integral of that convolution should be unity, then it doesn't change the, the um, mean values. And if I apply that to the sign, then you see that the sign remains at its position. The only thing that changes is the amplitude. So that's interesting. So now I convolve it with the Gaussian. And again, the sign uh, happily survives it. The only thing that changes is the amplitude again. But in this case, the phase is unchanged. And it remains the same sign. So no other frequencies pop up. Just that sign, if you convolve it, it happily survives if nothing else comes out. I take this asymmetrical function. If I convolve with that, then you see now my sign shifts to the left. But again, no, no other cosines, nothing else pops up. The sign uh, survives the convolution. And if I just convolve it with a bit of rubbish, then you see in this, the rubbish was too symmetrical, so there is almost no shift. And basically, the, the sign survives again. So I cannot change the frequency of that sign. I can change the phase of that sign. And that means that there is actually a very uh, profound relation between uh, convolution and frequency filtering. And that you can, uh, it's illustrated here. So consider a profile here where only one pixel is non-zero and all the other pixels are zero. Now I've taken the Fourier transform of that. So I get a lot of signs. And you see that in this case for this peak, they all have to work together to explain that peak. You see, they all get their maximum at that peak. And remarkably everywhere else, there is completely destructive interference. It's hard to believe, but by doing this, they kill each other nicely everywhere except in that single pixel. Now, the whole thing is linear. So if I would put another pixel here, I could make a very similar drawing, but now everything would be shifted to that other pixel. If I then add them together, then I would have uh, two pixels here, and here I would have the Fourier transform of the two pixels. So it would look a lot messier, and somehow they would manage to collaborate creating those two peaks and kill every other amplitude everywhere. Fascinating, happens all the time. All right, now the convolution. So we know that the convolution, this is a nicely symmetrical one, is not gonna change the phases. All it's gonna do is changing amplitudes. 
So that means there is two ways to go from here to here. Either we can apply the convolution recipe, which would say, okay, you have to replace this guy with the convolution recipe, and then you get that pretty trivial. Or you can say, no, no, convolving with this, we know it's just going to change amplitudes of signs. Therefore, we can go the other way. We can just first write this as a sum of signs, apply the convolution to the signs. That's easy. We just change the amplitudes. That means we filter the sign, only the amplitudes, not the phases in this case. We get this. If we add it together, we get that. This seems like a needlessly complicated thing to do, but that's not true because we can compute a Fourier transform and the computer will not do the effort of storing actually all these sampled signs. It will just store their amplitude, uh, phase, and frequency. So the number of things to store is exactly 20 as before. Filtering is very easy. Of these 20 numbers, you, you change the amplitudes, but not the phases. And then you do the inverse Fourier transform, which is equivalent to adding this up. So that means going this way is pretty fast too. And who wins the, the race depends on the width of this thing. So if this thing is wide enough, then you have a lot of work to do in image domain because you have to run over all pixels. And for every pixel, you have to distribute that intensity over a very wide range. So that's a lot of work. And in those cases, the Fourier transform is actually a lot faster. If you have a very narrow kernel, then it's uh, typically faster to do it in the image domain. OK, so now to 2D, because I've shown you this bottom of filter, but that was in two dimensions. So here is a bit more on this two dimension of filter. But first, I have to show you that I'm going to represent the, the, these as images and not as profiles as I did before. So here is a brain image, and if I would have plotted it in as a, as a two-dimensional plot, then you get this. But for us, it's very hard to see that this is a brain image. So I prefer to represent it as that. And that means that I have to represent my signs also as images, so you can see the relation. All right. And so this is a two-dimensional sign. So it's very simple. It's a sign in one dimension, and it's just uniform in the other dimension. And if I show it as an image, it looks like that. So the only thing you need to use your fantasy a bit, because here black means uh, negative and white means positive. And here black is zero and white is positive. So that, that you cannot see in the image. So you need to know that. All right. So now a Fourier transform in 2D corresponds to writing your image as a sum of a lot of signs. And now we need uh, an awful amount of them. So they now get not only a direction and a phase and an amplitude. Uh, sorry, they not only get an amplitude, a phase, and a frequency, but also a direction. So they, they only are assigned in one direction. In the other direction, they're just uniform. All right, so they look a bit like this, but I don't know the English word. But yeah. If I change the amplitude, then they will become grayer. In, in this uh, image representation. And if I change the frequency, keeping the direction and the amplitude, just the waves will get uh, narrower and, and these stripes will get closer to one another. Now, usually, um, if you actually read papers or if you look into software of Fourier transform, things are slightly more complicated. So you will start seeing things like that. Um, and the reason is that one makes use of these expressions. So we are interested in uh, sines and cosines, because if I add a sine and a cosine, I get uh, an oscillating function of the same frequency. So I get a sine with a different phase. So combining them with different weights basically is the same as shifting the function from left to right. And the combined amplitude determines the amplitude of the output. Now, in, in what we typically do in Fourier transform is making it for us a bit more complicated than necessary. So we use this function, this um, uh, yeah, mathematical equality, which is that the exponent of omega x times i, where i is the square root of minus 1, equals this. And so that way, we can, with complex numbers, separate the cosines and the sines. Actually, we don't need to separate them. Our intention is to add them. But here, they are nicely separated. And then to get the cosine back, we just have to combine the negative and the positive frequencies. 
which makes sense because a cosine is symmetrical. So there is no difference between a cosine with a negative and a positive frequency. So if we add them together and divide by two, then the sign is killed and the whole thing pops out um, and is a real number. If we subtract the two, then the sign will pop out and that makes sense too because the sign is asymmetrical. So if you flip it, it's the same as multiplying it with minus one. So if we uh, subtract these two, we get the sign out, but it will be an imaginary, uh, totally imaginary because of this i. So that's why we have to apply it with i2 to get rid of that. So this way we can always get back our cosines and sines and add them together, uh, which is what the inf uh, inverse Fourier transform will be. And if you then look at Fourier 2D Fourier images, they look like this. So um, for example, this thing here is the the value of the DC component, the amplitude of the DC component. And here is the amplitude of um, this one, of E omega X with a plus here. And at the other side is the amplitude of this guy. So they have the same amplitude, meaning that the thing is symmetrical. If we add two, we get the cosine and there will be something to be seen here because it's two positive values. If we subtract them, there will be nothing left because this minus that's gonna be zero. So this is a symmetrical function. It's a cosine. It will look like that. Um, with, with, um, if you flip it, then you would get exactly the same image. And so it's always real in this case, right? Because the, this imaginary part um, will be deleted. And then if, if uh, we take the signs, then we need to make one minus the other one, such that if we add them, we get no cosine. And if we subtract them, we get the sign. But we also have this i, so this thing is always imaginary. But after the inverse Fourier transform, it will compensate for that, and we get uh, this. So we still get the amplitudes of our cosines and sines, but uh, the sines end up in the imaginary part. Okay. Because we exclusively work with real images, we actually don't need this. This is richer than we have to that we need. But the nice thing is you can also take Fourier transforms of complex images. So you can insert uh, two images at the same time, one real and one imaginary, take the Fourier transform, do some stuff, do the inverse Fourier transform, and then you can uh, get back your two images out of that. Or you can take the, the Fourier transform of uh, any other complex image where that complex uh, that being complex means something physical. All right, <clears throat> so back to our uh, little example. So we had this brain image and now I start adding harmonics again. So this is the DC component, the no frequency at all. So this is the mean of the entire image. And here I add all the signs in all directions which have a, a, a frequency of one. I cannot show them all because there's really many, many of them. So, but they will create a big blob in the middle, which is where the brain is, of course. And if I start adding more signs in all directions, in this case, I get more and more detail. And so to see fine detail, like this uh, gray matter, uh, central gray matter structures, I need a lot of uh, harmonics, because you see, if I go lower here, they start getting very smooth. Again, if the question was, is there a patient at all in this scanner? I can stop already here, because we see there was radioactivity. Now, one reason to filter is the noise. And as you all know, um, MLM produces noise, FEP also produces noise, uh, usually of different flavors. So that is, uh, and the reason is, of course, that our measurements are noisy. If they wouldn't be noisy, we would have very nice measurements, but we would decide that we injected too much activity into the patient. So we will inject less. And then our images will be noisy again. So this is gonna be, always true. As soon as we find that our images are so good that we don't need to filter them, we will start injecting this. So we're guaranteed to have lousy images of the clinic. So we're gonna do, have to do something about the noise. And what we can do is convolve it or filter it in the Fourier domain. As I just said, it's up to you. you it will produce exactly the same result. And so here I look at the profile again. So we have this profile. Here is a noisy version of that. You see, it looks, looks noisy. And then I have filtered it a bit aggressively. 
And you can again wonder, was this okay or not? Again, it depends on what you want to see. You see the profile is more or less preserved, but if you happen to be very interested in this structure, then this filter is not recommended because it basically deleted that structure. But you have to admit that the noise is less. Now, this is seems pretty trivial, but I think it's still interesting to mention it, uh, which is that you, if you have many dimensions, you can consider filtering in all of them. And uh, that seems pretty obvious in a two-dimensional image. If you filter it in one direction, you get, first of all, uh, non-isotropic non -isotropic, uh, features in those images, which are disturbing. And second, you need to act apply very aggressive smoothing in that one dimension to get rid of the noise. And that's much less true in 2D. And the reason is by smoothing, we basically compute the weighted average of a voxel and its neighbors. But to suppress the noise significantly, we need a sufficient amount of neighbors. But if you have only one dimension, you have to go pretty far to get your number of neighbors. And the chances that these neighbors are actually uh, a good representation offering you a lot of information about the pixel you're considering decreases, of course, if you go further and further, because our image is not uniform. So if you start getting far away, then you probably get wrong values. And that's what you see here. You see all these stripes. Uh, so that, that 1D filtering was not a good idea. Here we have two dimensions, so we can filter in 2D. And to get the same number of neighbors, we can stay much closer to the original pixel, where the assumption that those pixels are heavily correlated is more satisfying. Seems trivial here. If you have 3D images, it's all already a bit less trivial because typically we look at them at the screen and we see these transaction images. And so you might forget that you can smooth in the Z dimension too. But sometimes we have 4D, 5D, 6D images. And so if you start smoothing those, it's very interesting to think, yeah, what kind of smoothing or parameter reduction can I apply in each of those dimensions to get rid of the noise? So it becomes less trivial if you have more and more dimensions. And again, uh, it's a good idea to stay close to your uh, original pixel. So using all these dimensions is probably a good idea. And this is the last slide. Um, and I show it because uh, in the next series, I'm going to talk about image reconstruction. And as you all know, in filter back correction, a RAM filter is used. And the RAM filter is the opposite of what I've been showing all the time. So I've been showing filters that smooth. And that's because, yeah, because humans are actually very bad with processing noise. Because, of course, if you smooth an image, you throw away information. So you can never unsmooth it. At least if, if you zero some frequencies, as we have been doing. Um, where have we been doing that? Here. Um, which is slide 13. So by filtering this, those frequencies have been zero. So we can never unfilter them again. So that means this image definitely contains less information than that. And the same is true for the image that I show here. This image contains less information than that. The reason that we like it still is that our visual system is very bad in processing noise, and in particular, correlated noise. It, it appears that we can do some mental noise decorrelation, but not a lot. So if we have heavy correlated noise, that disturbs us more than it should. And if we smooth that a bit, then those correlations uh, are uh, reduced. And as an effect of that, we, or at least the negative correlations are reduced. And as an effect of that, we start seeing more in the images also, although there actually is less. All right, and I'm sure does the opposite. So intuitively you would think you don't like it <coughs> because it unsmooths. And so if there was noise, it's gonna make it even worse. So the recipe is a bit weird. Instead of saying to this pixel, you have to distribute your activity, your neighbors, we have to say the opposite. So we have to say you're gonna steal activity from your neighbors. And that's what this pixel is doing. So it steals a lot from its direct neighbors, but then it's a bit weird. It, it gives a little bit to the next neighbor and takes away a bit more from the, a bit less from the other neighbor. So this thing oscillates, it oscillates forever. It's easier to understand what it's doing in the frequency domain. And there it's amplifying the frequencies uh, more as they get higher in a nicely linear way. I'll show that uh, the next time. 
So it's actually zeroing, or in a discrete version, almost zeroing the DC component, There's nothing left here. But for all the other components, it's amplifying them more as they get higher. So the highest frequency gets amplified most. You can wonder, well, I guess you don't because you know fit the back direction, but if you didn't know, you would wonder why the hell would you do a thing like that? And the reason is, well, we want to unsmooth something because we know we're gonna smooth it afterwards. And we, because we know it, we can already consider undoing it. And so the nice thing about this filter is that it can be inverted. There is just a small problem here where we have multiplied things with zero, but that is only exactly in the DC component and nowhere else. So we create a singularity, but we can deal with that in discrete, uh, in discrete world. So this thing is invertible. And so it exists because we're gonna do a back fraction, which introduces a lot of smoothing, and this run filter will undo that smoothing. 